thank you all for coming. Okay, as uh, Luke mentioned, this is the last in the uh, series called Origins, right? Where we actually trace the origins of um, iconic images. Okay, um, you know, from its beginnings all the way, you know, even to, to showing contemporary examples, right? And that's what I'm going to do today as well, okay, with the uh, polygonal image. Now, I think you've heard of the, the saying, um, you know, politics and religion don't mix, or sports and politics don't mix, right? Um, but in reality, right, uh, that's often not the case. Okay, but when you think about, but how about art and politics? Do they mix? Right? I mean, there are some people who subscribe, you know, um, to the view that art should be pure, right? Meaning it should be removed from any kind of uh, social or political concerns, right? But, um, you know, often, um, you know, that in reality, in fact, uh, that's again not often the case. Right. In fact, um, you know, all the way from the beginning of time or beginning of civilization, right? Um, you know, uh, people, right, or in particular rulers, have recognized, okay, the kind of um, power, right, of the image, okay, the power of art, right? Um, you know, um, to advance political purposes, right? Um, Okay, so, and you know, I mean, this, this is the case even till today. Okay, for example, um, if you look around you, if you just look at the newspapers each day, all right, the images that you see of politicians, right, for example, I mean, all those images, you know, are carefully manipulated and edited, right, to project a certain image, right, of that particular person or individual, all right. If you look at advertisements or ads, Okay, it's the same thing, right? Okay, and uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the purpose of the ad is again to, to convey subtle messages that will kind of manipulate your desires and your needs, right? Um, if you look at logos around you, I mean, today they are full of logos, you know, symbols around you, okay? And even that, you know, subconsciously have an effect, right, on you as well, whether it's political logo or, you know, a commercial logo, like the Nike logo, for example. Okay, I'm going to start by um, showing you this picture. Uh, have you all seen this picture before? Okay, this is the, f uh, the photo of, um, you know, the, the toppling of Saddam Hussein's uh, statue, right, when uh, the Americans invaded Iraq. Okay, and this took place in uh, April the 9th, 2003. Okay, now I find this uh, I image interesting, right? Because it's really an image within an image, okay? I mean, there are, there are layers of uh, uh, propaganda here, right? Firstly, when you look at this photo, okay, it's a, it's a photograph of Saddam Hussein's statue, okay, which was actually erected in honor of his 65th birthday in 2002, right? Okay, and... Um, you know, and, and again, he, he shows him, right, uh, you know, with his uh, right hand extended. That's a kind of a traditional pose of the orator, and which you find, you know, um, you know similar poses in, in a lot of other uh, images throughout history. Okay. And uh, now, so Saddam Hussein's um, sculpture or statue was itself, uh, you know, a kind of a propagandistic, you know, um, image, okay, and then you have the um, the, the 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 wall that broke out, and then um, you know the the Iraqi people, okay, coming together to try to topple the statue and bring it down, okay, from its pedestal, okay, um, and what happened was that you know for for some of you who are familiar with the with the uh, the kind of the story, um, the American troops then came to lend a helping hand. Okay, and in fact, the, the statue of, is, it was eventually brought down by an American armored vehicle. Okay, so you can see that here the American soldiers, in turn, actually, you know, orchestrated the whole scene. Okay, and journalists and even a camera crew were invited. And in fact, the toppling of the statue was shown live. Okay, I think on CNN. 
right? So you can see that this particular photo, right, this particular image also serves a kind of propagandistic purpose for the American soldiers themselves, okay, for the American side as well. Right? So it's an interesting image in that, in that sense. And how about this? Right? This was just taken, I think, uh, I think last week. Okay, I mean, you know that they are celebrating, China is celebrating the 120th anniversary okay, of uh, Mao's uh, uh, you know, uh, birth. And, uh, you know, they are, and they are spending you know, a lot of money on, you know, on, that, on those celebrations. Okay, and this particular one was the, is worth about $21 million, made of gold and jade. Okay, and it took about 20 artists, about 8 months to finish this. Okay, showing Mao cross-legged, right? And, um, you know, but, but again, you know, the, the cult of Mao, you know, has uh, been so enduring. Oh, sorry. Oh, so sorry. I normally stand here, I don't know why today. No wonder you all look a bit puzzled. Okay, now the cult of Mao is still very, you know, it's still so strong today, right? And, uh, you know, again, and images are a way of uh, preserving his cult, I suppose. Okay, later on we'll see one or two other examples. And this, okay, I'm sure you are familiar with this. <laughs> right, you have, uh, of course, the third generation is missing. You have uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong, the father. I just slipped my mind. Kim Jong Il and Kim Il Sung, correct, and of course Kim Il Sung's son, Kim Jong An, right? And you could see, I mean, you know, the such kind of what you call, you know, state portraits, okay, of portraits of um, of rulers are especially um, prevalent, I would say, in uh, totalitarian regimes, right? You you find it, for example, in Stalin Russia, you know, you find it. Uh, in Mao China and of course you know in North Korea right um, and you know and, and again in, in such regimes you can see the kind of reverence they are paid to such images okay although we know that they're just uh, I suppose photographs or paintings okay but they, are, they often act as what they call proxies right for um, you know the, this, this, um, these rulers Okay, and this idea actually originated way back in the Roman Empire. Okay, where often you know the statues or the busts of Roman emperors okay were placed in uh, you know certain buildings. Okay, in proxy of the emperor himself. So it's as good as you know the emperor being present himself. And there are, there are quite a number of devices used to glorify a ruler's image. Okay, the first one is to idealize him, right? So to speak, to make him perfect. Okay, I'll, I'll talk more about this, right? The idealized image. And then you have, um, through the use of symbols and compositional devices, for example, in terms of skill and size, you know? I mean, one of the, the common devices in ancient times was to make the ruler, you, you can definitely tell who the, you know, the, 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 the ruler is, right? Just by looking at his size and skill. And, you know, also this, you know, ruler, rulers throughout history, okay, have claimed a divine lineage and they make use of images, right, to kind of justify their divine origins or their divine lineage, right? And we find this is the case, you know, from all the way from, I suppose, ancient Egypt, even down to North Korea, right, today, right, where, you know, rulers are still trying to create a kind of myth, right, um, around themselves. Okay, for example, the Japanese uh, empress, right, claim lineage from this, uh, this uh, sun goddess called Amaterasu, right, so the whole line of Japanese empress claim lineage from the sun goddess. Now this is, um, you know, one of the earliest, I would say, uh, uh, propagandistic image, okay, but it's actually a kind of a stele. A stele is an upright stone, okay, and um, 
you know, this dates back to the uh, period of uh, the Mesopotamian period. Um, and what's interesting is this, that um, it contains what you call laws, right? In fact, there are about 280 something laws inscribed on the stone. Okay, so, and these laws were in fact um, um, instituted by a ruler called Hammurabi. Okay, Hammurabi was a Babylonian ruler. Okay, and he's also known as the world's oldest lawgiver. Right? And in fact, the laws that he sort of instituted or established, okay, um, in fact are quite modern okay, by, by you know, today's standard. Right? And he um, believed in the principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, literally. Okay, for example, if you were to destroy the eyes of another person, your own eyes would be destroyed. Okay, um, and then if you if a builder were to build a house that eventually collapsed and kills its occupants, okay, that builder would, okay, be slain, okay, and if the building collapsed and killed the owner's son, right, the builder's son would be slain, okay. But there are some uh, kind of um, you know. Uh, 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 um, funny laws, but by and large, you know, it's, it's really, uh, you are punished in accordance to the crime that you commit, right? Okay, but what's interesting is not really, you know, I'm going to talk about the laws themselves, but the upper part of the stele, if you look at the upper part, right, you see two figures there. Okay, now I talk about compositional devices. Okay, can anyone tell me here, okay, which one do you think, okay, is Hammurabi himself, and which one is a god here? Can anyone tell? Which is the king, and which is his god? Okay, the god's name is Shamesh, right? He's the sun god. All right, I think he's the god of the law as well, if I'm not mistaken. Anyone can, can tell me? The one on the right is... Precisely. Okay, now um, there are a few things that indicate that, you know, uh, he's the god Shamesh. Firstly, if you look at him, he's seated, right? But even then, you can see in terms of size, he's still the equal of Hammurabi who's standing. Okay, and if you look at his shoulders, okay, there are some things that is kind of emanating from his shoulders. Okay, those are actually fire or flame. Okay, right? And if you look at his feet, the feet is actually standing, or rather it's emerging from an abstract mountain. Okay, right? So all these indicate, you know, the, the kind of, um, the divine qualities of the God. Okay, and what's he trying to do here? Now, he's in fact presenting um, the rod and the ring, right, to Hammurabi. Okay, and um, you know, this stele itself will have been open you know, to be seen in public. And um, anyone who see this would, the message is quite clear, okay, that, you know, the king wanted his people to know that he has the kind of divine legitimacy to rule, okay. The God has given him the right to rule and also the right to impose or establish his laws. Can you see that? So it's quite clear that this is, uh, you know, one of the earliest you know, images of propaganda in art, right? Um, let's go on. This uh, whole city is about eight feet high. And we go to ancient Egypt. Now, in uh, ancient Egypt, um, you know, the, again, um, statues of the pharaohs okay, were done in accordance with certain convention. Okay, because the pharaohs were seen as uh, you know, not a mortal human. Okay, they were seen again as divine or semi-divine beings. Okay, it's believed that when the Egyptian pharaoh died, okay, he would be kind of um, incarnated as the god Osiris. Okay. So there's a particular way of portraying him. Okay, and if you look at it, um, of course, it looks rather rigid, okay, because it's still, you, you can see, you know, it's, it's still very much part of the block, so it looks very block-like, okay, very rigid, right? Um, but there are certain things to observe when you look at images of Pharaoh, 
right? And uh, in fact, Egyptian sculptors, Egyptian artists could not depart from these conventions. Okay, so there are certain ways of portraying the pharaoh. Okay, for example, he would be shown with um, his headdress called the Nemes, N-E-M-E-S. Okay, he would be, have the false beard, right? Um, his left foot would be forward, okay, and his, uh, his um, arms would be, you know, um, at, the, at his sides, okay, and his fist clenched, okay. So all these were, are meant to convey the kind of the superhuman quality or attribute of the pharaoh, okay, to show that he's not a human being, right. So, you know, it, it, you know so there's no, no necessity to portray him in a realistic manner. Right, okay, because it's not a, a mere mortal, it's not a mere human. Right, now the only kind of uh, human quality in, in this sculpture, very interestingly, is his wife. Okay, and his wife seemed to be, you know, a little bit there's a bit more naturalism in her, right? And she holds her, her husband, you know, um, around his waist with her right hand, and you know, his, his uh, left arm with her left hand. Okay. And that kind of a loving um, so-called moment, you know, you don't get to see a lot in Egyptian art. Okay. So it's quite surprising that you, know, you get to see it here. And you know, the pharaoh will sometimes have other attributes like the royal cobra you know, on his forehead okay, to, protect, right, to protect him okay, and, and other sort of aspects. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that Egyptian sculpture follow a certain hierarchy, a certain convention in portraying the pharaoh. Okay. In fact, the less important you, you were, the more realistic okay, your image would tend to be. Okay. So, so we, we do have um, some realistic images okay, of um, you know, non-royal people. Okay, but pharaohs would normally be portrayed in this way. All right, and then the, we go on to the, what do you call the um, Byzant, Byzantine or Byzantine period, okay, in roughly to about the 6th century. Okay, and this particular mosaic, okay, um, I mean mosaic is an art form which uh, utilizes uh, cut stones, right, okay, or sometimes marble. Okay, and, um, and, and, this particular mosaic can be found in a church called the Church of San Vitali in Ravenna, Italy. Okay, and it shows the court of Justinian. Now, Justinian was a person who uh, was responsible for, um, you know, um, recapturing many of the territories that were lost, right, um, in the Western Roman Empire. Okay, so the Byzantine Empire is actually an Eastern Roman Empire, and Justinian helped to reclaim or re conquered many of these territories, including some in Italy. Okay. Now, this mosaic can be found in the apse. Okay. In the apse is a, a part of the church. Right. Okay. In fact, there, it comes in a pair. All right. You have um, on one side Justinian and on the other side is a mosaic of his wife with her own entourage, her own retinue. Okay. Now, this is without a doubt a political image. Right. Firstly, you know, if you look at Justinian, he has a halo, right? He has a halo, H-A-L-O, right? Now, as you know, a halo is like a, a, a kind of a, a circle of light, okay, right? Radiating from the head of a, a sacred or holy person, okay? But not a king, okay? Now, the, the fact that he has a halo here, okay, tells us that he, wants, he wanted to be shown, okay, as a, some kind of, um, you know, a kind of earthly representative of Christ or God. Okay, and if you look at his retinue, okay, he's surrounded by both, both um, um, two groups of people, okay, the military on his right, okay, and on his left, the clergy, the church. Okay, so, you know, again, here, you know, it's a very kind of, um, you know, overt political statement that he wanted to make, right? Okay, that he's both not only the ruler of an empire, okay, but he's also, in a sense, the head of the church, okay? So it's a very clear political message that's conveyed, right, 
through this mosaic. Okay, and it's significant as to what he carries. Can you see that he's, carry, he's carrying an object? Okay, now that's actually a, a you know um, a kind of vessel that contains um, um, the 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 sacrament. Okay, the sacrament is the, the the bread. Okay, which represents the body of Jesus. Okay, and op on the opposite side, his wife will be carrying a chalice containing the blood or the wine. Okay, the wine symbolizing the blood of Jesus. Okay, so this is clearly a very you know a political image. Okay, that Justinian wanted to convey. And on his left as well, you see um, a very important person, the Archbishop. Right? And interestingly, you know, he has his name on top of him. <laughs> okay, although Justinian doesn't have one, right? But he has his name sort of inscribed above him. Okay, so, um, so you could see that, you know, um, again, as I said, Justinian wanted to show that, you know, he's both the head of the empire as well as the church. Now it shows you the a close up or a detail of the, the uh, you know um, the image here. Okay. And notice how they replace the mosaics, right? As I mentioned, the mosaics are cut pieces of stones. Okay, and during the Byzantine period, they like to, you know, sort of um, staff gold leaf. Okay, um, in between the marble or the stone. Okay, as a result, you get this uh, very glittering gold-like background. Now, is this the first political logo? Okay, now this is uh, what you call a derrick. Okay, it's a Persian derrick. Okay, it's just, well, it's just a Persian coin. Okay, a coin that was uh, minted, okay, during the Persian Empire. Okay, and it's, I mean, Darius the Great, I mean, Darius the Great was um, the, you know, the great king of Persia. Right, and he was the one I believe who started, you know, the kind of the minting, you know, of, of these coins, right? Um, and inevitably, you know, you will show, you know, uh, the king himself on the coin. Um, in fact, uh, minting of coins was a kind of royal prerogative. Okay, and here uh, it probably shows Darius himself, okay, or some other king. And if you notice. It shows the king carrying a bow and arrow as an archer. Okay, and in fact, throughout history, um, you know, the archer has become associated with royalty. Okay, with the nobility. Okay, and um, and so, you know, by posing himself as an archer, okay, or by adopting the archer as his political image. Um, the riots, okay, was clearly trying to, you know, to, to kind of um, state his authority here, okay, because people who have seen this coin would, would know what the archer represented, okay, it not only represented military prowess, okay, it also represented wisdom, leadership, and more importantly, balance and control, okay, these are qualities you need for, you know, um, you know, to, to govern the empire. Okay, so these coins will be minted and circulated throughout the empire, right? And um, you know, and, and it's quite clear that um, you know the riots wanted his subjects to see him in a certain light, right? Okay, so this is really you know perhaps the first political logo that we have, okay, or one of the first political logo. And in fact, when Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire. He actually melted down many of his coins and actually reminted these coins as his own. Okay, so Alexander the Great also saw the kind of the political value of these coins. Okay, and I mean, you know, it still persists today. If you look at your dollar note, I mean, those dollar notes, if you look carefully, okay, sometimes they are political figures and other, you know, uh, uh, propagandistic sort of, uh, you know, images on the notes. Okay, royalty have always availed themselves of exquisite objects of power. Okay, this could include, for example, garments, jewelry, and other regalia. Okay, that expresses their power. Okay, I'm just going to show you 
I'm sure you have seen the dragon's rope, right? Um, you know, at a in a museum. Um, now, this is the Emperor Chenlong. Okay, one of the, the two great emperors, the other one being Kangxi. Right, Kangxi, I, I believe he was his grandfather. Okay, and um, yeah, and here you can see that you know he's seated on a dragon throne. Um, again, you know, the emperor, right, especially the Qing emperor, okay, knew how to you know harness or utilize such symbols, okay, to to emphasize or to state their you know, their authority, okay, and their, their imperial power, okay. But this uh, title called the Son of Heaven, in fact, did not originate uh, with the Qing, okay. In fact, I mean, it's most popularly associated with Qin, but actually it originated in the Chou Dynasty, okay, where the Chou kings called themselves Sons of Heaven, okay. And um, in fact, the Chinese emperors have another title called um, uh, what do you call it? Qian, Qian Long, dragon? Okay, or... Now let me see. Okay, slip my mind now. Okay, but anyway, the dragon, okay, has always, you know, um, been associated with the emperor. Okay, because the, the dragon itself is a deity of the clouds and the rain. Okay, and it was um, uh, believed to symbolize water. Okay, it was believed to, you know, to be able to bring rain right and to create new life and also it's a symbol of good omen okay so you see the the dragon right uh, becoming closely associated with the the son of heaven the chinese emperor okay and here you can see him wearing his dragon robe okay and seated on a dragon throne okay and um if you look at the robe this is what they call a, a semi-formal robe Okay, is um, if you look at the sleeves, they have a very interesting looking sleeve, right? The sleeves are tapered, right? It's a tapered, tapered down to the shape of uh, horse hooves. Okay, and there are slits at the front and the back and also at the sides, okay? For ease, no, I mean for ease of riding, okay? When you want to ride a horse, okay? But I think more importantly, uh, what you see on the dragon rope itself, the emblems of power, okay? Um, you will see, for example, um, nine dragons. Okay, on the dragon rope, there are there are actually nine dragons. Okay, the dragons are normally. Um, okay, it's, it's it's working, right? It's normally it normally has four five claws, right? Now only the emperor's um, dragon, okay, are depicted with five claws, and those that actually bestowed the right to have dragons with five claws. Right, so on the dragon rope, you'll see altogether about nine dragons. Okay, the ninth one is actually hidden, right, in, inside, um, you know, the flat. Okay, and you'll see them, uh, you know, twirling and curling amidst, you know, scrolling clouds. Okay, and if you look at the dragon rope, it's also embroidered with um, the so-called twelve auspicious symbols. Okay, this include, for example, the sun, the moon. Okay. Um, uh, you know, which represents the heavens, and then you have the mountains, right? And then you also have the axe, which um, uh, represents the emperor's uh, power to punish. Okay, so these are, and, and I suppose these symbols, um, in a sense, reinforce the emperor's status as the ruler of the universe. Okay, because these symbols are a lot. A lot of them have to do with cosmology, right? Okay, so they reinforce the emperor's uh, position as the son of heaven, okay, as the ruler of the universe. Oh, okay, so here you have, I mean, outwardly you only see eight dragons, okay, but actually there's a ninth one, okay, that you can't see from the outside. Okay, and those are the 12 auspicious symbols, right? Okay, for example, um, there's fire as well. I mean, the four elements are represented there water, earth, fire, etc. Okay, and then we, you know, again, um, this is a very significant image. 
Okay. Now the Romans were one of the first people to realize the potential of, you know, what we call art today or the image. Okay, to, in a sense, convey their power. Right, um, and you know, so if you look at some of the ruins today, if you go to Rome, right, you'll you'll come across, for example, triumphal arches. Okay, where the emperors will pass. All right. Okay, when they come back from a victorious uh, campaign. Okay, now this is what you call an equestrian portrait. Now equestrian portraits are, you know, um, portraits which show um, the subject on horseback. Okay, and normally equestrian portraits are the prerogative of uh, rulers and the nobility. Okay, now what makes this uh, particular equestrian portrait um, in, you know, unique is that it's the only one, the only one that, you know, um, the only surviving equestrian portrait from the Roman Empire. Okay, and the reason is this, that, you know, when the Christians sort of uh, took over Rome, okay, many of these pagan, okay, what the, what the Christians call pagan images were actually melted down, okay, except for this one, because they, mis they mistook this one for the portrait of Emperor Constantine which was the, actually the first Christian emperor. Okay, so, um, so this survived, okay. And it shows Marcus Aurelius, right? And, uh, you know, and Marcus Aurelius is uh, one of the great uh, Roman emperors, right? And in fact, we would have, we would think that, you know, s such equestrian portraits would have been quite common, okay? But this was the only one that survived, okay? And it would have been kind of erected whenever an uh, 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 emperor came back, okay, victorious from a campaign, right? Now, if you look at Marcus Aurelius, okay, you can see him with his right hand, okay, um, you know, extended, okay, which um, portrays him as an orator, addressing the crowd, addressing the people. And his left hand actually holds the rein of the horse. Okay. So, I suppose this whole image, you know, shows Marcus Aurelius as someone who is uh, very much in control. Okay, right. Even though, if you look at the horse, you know, he's, he's, the, the the emperor is very well in control of the situation. Okay, right. And in fact, if you look at his uh, his size, you know, he's he's quite quite a big figure, right, in proportion to the horse. Okay, and now technically, you know, this was also an achievement. Okay, this was made of bronze. Okay, and uh, you know, it was very much admired during the Renaissance. Okay, and it actually uh, influenced okay, some of the equestrian portraits that were done during the Renaissance, like those by Donatello okay, and Verrocchio. Right? Okay, again, the portraits of rulers are often idealized or exaggerated to emphasize their godlike and perfect qualities. Um, this is again uh, dating back to the uh, Roman period. Okay, and actually shows the first Roman emperor, okay, Augustus Caesar, okay, who is the grand nephew of uh, uh, Julius Caesar, right? And um, I suppose you know Augustus was um, probably you know the the. the I won't say the only, but you know, one of the few Roman emperors who really made use, okay, of uh, imagery, okay, to the to the full extent, right, to the full extent, okay. So sometimes you see him here, okay, um, being dressed up as a kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, military general, okay. In other images, you'll see him, uh, you know, dressing up as a chief priest, okay. So he's very well aware of, you know, the. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the kind of the uh, propagandistic value of, you know, images. Okay, now, here, and statues of Augustus, you know, always show him at the prime of his life. Okay, right, no matter how old he was. Okay, in fact, when this uh, image was done, okay, he was actually, you know, in his uh, middle ages. He was middle age, right, but yet, they, you know, they show him at, you know, at, his, at the prime of his life. Okay, and this was discovered at the villa of his wife. Okay, we suggest that after his death, there was a kind of a cult of Augustus that was established. Okay, but in any case, this whole image, you know, is 
really full of, you know, I would say political um, intent. Right now, do I have? Um, oh, I should have included the close up. Okay, never mind. Okay, what you see at, at the foot, okay, to the right of his feet, his right feet, okay, you see a dolphin, okay, and a kind of a cupid like figure riding on a dolphin. Okay, and normally the dolphin is associated, okay, rather the, 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 the um, in fact, the dolphin and both the dolphin and cupid are associated with the goddess Venus. Right, the goddess of love and beauty. Okay, so by including that image of the cupid and dolphin there, okay, Augustus clearly wanted to tell people that you know he actually descended from the gods, okay, from Venus herself. Right, and you again you can see him in an in a, in the pose of an orator. Okay, he um, you know he has his uh, right hand, okay, extended, addressing the crowd. Okay, but what's interesting also is the cuirass is wearing the armor. Okay, I mean the armor itself has amazing details. Okay, sorry I don't have a close up. Okay, but what you see there, if you can, if you can see somewhere in the middle. Okay, there are two figures there. Okay, one is actually the enemy of the Romans called the Parthians. Okay, they are actually surrendering the standard to a Roman soldier. Okay, and on top of the cuirass, the armor, you'll see a god holding a canopy. Okay, and by holding the canopy again, it symbolizes the kind of peace okay, that has uh, you know, come uh, to the Roman Empire or come upon the Roman Empire. And on, at the bottom, you'll see another figure, a mother goddess, holding what I call a cornucopia. A cornucopia it symbolizes abundance. Okay? So the message here is very clear. Right? Okay, um, you know, Augustus wanted to tell the people that you know, he has establish what they call the Pax Romana, okay, the Roman peace, right, okay, that the, the Roman Empire, you know, was, uh, was prosperous and was, um, you know, strong and secure under him or under his rule, okay, so it's very clear, you know, what this particular image wanted to achieve. Now, likewise with um, the surviving uh, uh, bust or portraits of Alexander the Great. Right, it always shows him, you know, uh, you know, at the prime of his life. Okay, and um, you know, here you, you see, um, and you know, th and this image, in fact, the images of Alexander the Great broke away from the Greek convention of, you know, depicting uh, sculptures of great men. Okay, because here he's shown without a beard. Okay, right, without a beard. So he actually broke away from convention. Okay, and um, again, you know, this is an uh, example of what you call an idealized image. Okay, that, that shows, um, you know, um, Alexander, okay, in almost, uh, you know, um, with almost perfect features. And we have buildings and expressions of power. Okay, um, I mean, I don't know what you think, but architecture, you know, is um, you know, it's more than just you know, um, a building with uh, with bricks or stone or steel. Okay, I mean, they are actually symbols of power as well. I, I suppose even today, right? Okay. I'm just going to highlight very quickly. Um, Two. Um, okay, before that, okay, this is a, 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 a quote. Okay, in fact, it's a memorandum by Jean Baptiste Colbert. Okay, to his king, Louis the Fourteenth. Now, Colbert was what he called like the principal advisor. Okay, to King Louis the Fourteenth. Right, and um, I mean you can read it. You know, uh, it's self-explanatory. Okay, he's, he's saying that, you know, apart from warfare, right, um, you know, there are other ways of conveying the power of the king. Okay, and one of that is through buildings. Okay, through buildings. Right? And in fact, um, Louis XIV himself recognized this. Okay, and in fact, during his reign, 
Okay, he, um, you know, there, there was a kind of um, um, state machinery, okay, a state propaganda machinery, okay, that utilized uh, artists, okay, to, to um, you know, to convey the power, okay, and authority of the king. Okay, and um, this is the king himself. He's quite dandy looking, right? Looks rather dandy with uh, his uh, high heel shoes, okay, and red high heel shoes, right? and exposed legs, okay. Um, well, actually, it's, you know, it's nothing like that. I mean, the high heel shoes could be explained, okay, by the fact that he's quite short, okay, and it was meant to compensate his height, okay. And those stockings are, I suppose, you know, part of the, the, the kind of traditional wear, okay, of, of the king, all right, okay, and um, of course he's wearing a wig, okay, but again, you know, portraits are very, oh, it's probably one of the most effective, if not the most effective means to convey power, status, and authority, all right, and this is a, what you call a frank demonstration of, okay, hegemony, prestige and power, okay, and um, and here you see that, you know, the king is surrounded by emblems of, you know, authority, okay, um, if you look at the, the fur line rope that he's wearing, okay, um, embroidered on it are what you call the fleur de lis, okay, the fleur de lis are these royal symbols, right, and um, he, and at the, in the background you'll see a, a column, Okay, normally columns are symbols of power in portraits of uh, kings and emperors and royalty. Okay, you normally find the column somewhere and also the curtain or the canopy. Okay, these are all emblems of power. Right? And of course, the sword as well and the throne. Okay, all those are emblems of power. This is an excellent portrait, you know. I mean, you know, it's, you know, and, and one can admire his, his realism and his meticulous details. And of course, you know, um, Versailles was built for Louis XIV himself. Okay? Now, Louis XIV you know, was very well aware of you know, art as a kind of political strategy or propagandistic tool. Okay? Very, he's very much aware of this. Okay? And Again, he's also aware that, you know, he could gain the kind of subservience or obedience of his subjects, okay, by claiming the divine right to rule, right? So, what happened is that King Louis XIV actually styled himself or called himself the Sun King after the Roman sun god Apollo. Okay, so if you go to the Palace of Versailles, okay, you'll see that it's full of symbols, you know, um, relating to the Sun King or to the Sun God, right? Of course, the Palace of Versailles is one of the biggest palaces in the world, right? And uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's not only the royal palace, it actually serves as a seat of government, okay? Um, I think at one time, you had up to 20,000 personnel, right, within the palace itself, okay? And... Uh, this is one of the most uh, um, striking part of the palace, the Hall of Mirrors. Okay, I believe they're all together 17 arch mirrors. Okay, so there are all these, what you call solar illu illusions throughout the palace. Right, that's to, to do with, you know, um, the sun. Okay, so for example, the, what the, the mirrors will do is that they will reflect, all right, the rays of the sun. And by doing that, they also multiply the glory of the Sun King, all right? So it's as much symbolic as anything else. And um, here again, you know, again, the garden itself, you know, and in the garden you'll find, for example, sculptures like this of Apollo's chariot, you know, I mean, Apollo used to ride his chariot across, across the sky, okay? And again, you know, it's, it's a clear sort of allusion, right, to the King himself, okay, the Sun King. Okay, and then, uh, you know, you have, of course, the Forbidden City. Um, 
and you know the Forbidden City is the, the, the largest palace in the world, right? And you know if you look at the Forbidden City itself, okay, I, I'm sure that you know you've been there, okay. Um, what is so striking is the layout, okay, of the Forbidden City. Now the Forbidden City was actually built during the Ming Dynasty, okay. Then it was later enlarged and renovated under the Qing rulers. Okay, and uh, it's called the Forbidden City for a reason, okay, because uh, you know uh, most people you know were, were not allowed you know into the Forbidden City, except the emperor, his concubines, eunuchs, and I suppose certain officials. Now the interesting part of this, uh, the Forbidden City, is the layout, okay, and the layout was done according to the Chinese cosmological uh, diagram, okay, or beliefs. Okay, and if you look at the, 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 the orientation, right, is oriented towards a kind of a north-south, east-west axis. Okay, the three most important buildings of the outer court, okay, actually face south. Okay, that is the, the Hall of Supreme Harmony, okay, Preserving Harmony, and, um, you know, and one other building. Okay, and then at, at the, the back you have the inner court. Okay, that's really the private residence of the emperor and his concubines. Okay, right. So the, those are the three most important buildings in the Forbidden City: the Hall of um, Medium Harmony, Supreme Harmony, and Protective Harmony. Right. Okay. Um, and you can see that those three buildings are aligned. Right. Okay, and they are aligned. You know. Um, with the Meridian Gate as well. Okay, this is the. Okay, after you enter the Meridian Gate, okay, you you find you come across these bridges. Okay, intersected by this uh, winding watercourse. And this is the most important building, the Hall of Supreme Harmony, where the most important ceremonies took place, like the ascension of a new emperor. Okay, the emperor's birthday. Okay, they all took place here, right in this hall. And again, um, you know, if you look at the Forbidden City, I mean, certain motifs, certain symbols sort of, um, you know, are almost ubiquitous, like clouds, okay, cloud motifs, and especially dragons, okay, because as I said, the dragon came to represent the emperor himself, right, the emperor himself. Um, okay, and you'll find that certain colors predominate, like yellow, Okay. In fact, during the Qing period, only the emperor was, you know, allowed. Okay. I mean, yellow was the prerogative of the emperor. Okay. For example, I showed you the, the dragon's robe earlier. Okay. Only the emperor could wear a yellow dragon's robe. Okay. The rest of uh, the people, like the heir to the throne, the princess, and other low officials, they wore other colors. Okay. Like blue or brown. Okay. So yellow was the prerogative. The exclusive uh, sort of color of the emperor. Okay, and um, and it's also interesting if you look at the animal ornaments on top of the roof. Okay, the more animals there are, the more important the building is. Okay. Okay, as I mentioned again, um, you'll find clouds. Okay, uh, motifs and dragon motifs everywhere, on balustrades, on walls, on columns on marble sort of uh, panels like this, right? Marble walkways. Okay. Now this is simply an impressive, you know, uh, piece of art. I mean, I, I'm sure you agree, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm sure you have taken a long time, okay, to carve this out. Okay, I'm gonna show you some, uh, okay, now I'm, this is uh, Napoleon, right? Napoleon Bonaparte, okay? Um, to his uh, minister of police, this is what he says, the masses must be guided without their knowing it. Okay, and Napoleon, you know, he, in fact, he saw the value or the, the potential of, uh, of art, of images, all right? To perpetuate his own myth, his own legend, okay? And I think that was very effective. I mean, you know, even after his death, you know, that kind of myth or legend even persists. OK. 
Okay? And he created a kind of a, a propagandistic machinery okay, that helped to, to um, um, project okay, certain uh, kind of um, image of, of him, both within France and outside, okay, and of his regime. Okay, now this is um, a painting by Jacques Louis David. Okay, now Jacques Louis David, well, he said he's um, what do you call a neoclassical painter. Okay, and he's an interesting character. Okay, because he actually supported the revolution, the French Revolution. In fact, he voted for the death of uh, Louis the Sixteenth. Okay, and and his queen and yeah, Marie Antoinette, right? But later on, you know, when, when Napoleon ascended the throne, um, you know, he sort of um, um, worked for the emperor, okay? Uh, he became like, I suppose, the kind of what you can call a court painter to Napoleon, right? And um, his images, his paintings, okay, helped really to perpetuate, right, the, the kind of the, the myth of the emperor, okay, and, and the, the popularity of the emperor. Okay, this is a very, one of the, the most well-known images, I think, in, in Western art. Okay, Jacques-Louis David, Napoleon at Saint Bernard Pass. Okay. Now, this painting was done to commemorate the crossing of the Alps by Napoleon's troops, okay, uh, in which they actually defeated the Austrians. Right? Okay, but if you look at this uh, uh, image carefully, right, this is like what? High hole silver, right? What do you call that? <laughs> okay, Napoleon on a on, uh, rearing uh, Arabian stallion, right, okay, and his, uh, you know, his uh, right arm, you know, in fact, pointing um, to the Alps, okay, which is not really visible here, right, okay, but in fact, you know, I mean, historically, actually, this whole painting does not reflect historical fact, okay, and the historical fact is this, that, you know, Napoleon did not lead his troops across the Alps, he only followed them two days later, and he was riding on a donkey, okay, not a horse. <laughs> so you can see that how, okay, David actually orchestrated, you know, this um, this whole painting, right? Okay, and um, and you know Napoleon, you know, was uh, also of a short stature, but you know it doesn't come across here as well, okay. Which shows him, you know, to be a rather heroic figure, okay. And what's interesting as well, if you look at the rocks, can you see the rocks? There are three names. Bonaparte is one. Hannibal is the other. And the other one is the, um, what's his name? The Charlemagne, right? Charlemagne. Okay, the Holy Roman Emperor. Okay, so... I mean, clearly here, David wanted to show Bonaparte as following, you know, what Hannibal and Charlemagne had achieved. They too had crossed the Alps, right? Okay, so really this whole image is to cement, right, the kind of, the, the, the greatness, okay, the, of, of, of Napoleon and to perpetuate this myth, okay, very clearly, okay? Um, likewise with this image, I mean, you know, we can see something in common, Right, with Napoleon's image, okay, it's, it's also a highly sort of staged, right, um, you know, and the artist wanted to show Lenin, right, in a certain, uh, uh, you know, a uh, certain way, okay, and in fact, uh, interestingly in Russia, okay, what happened was when the Bolsheviks, okay, when the Bolsheviks took over Russia from the Tsar, okay, and, and uh, you know, and, and in about 1917, okay, they actually embraced abstract art, okay, as, as um, uh, part of the kind of revolutionary ideal, because they wanted to, by, by embracing abstract art, okay, they actually rejected traditional art, which they associated with the, the Tsar and, you know, the, the traditional royal family, okay, but later on, they came to abandon, you know, they came to reject abstraction, and they came to embrace what they call social realism, Okay, and they came to recognize the power of images, okay, to to kind of convey the ideals of the Communist Party. Right? So, you know, here you have Lenin, okay, um, on the tribune, 
okay, here you have Lenin, you know, addressing, okay, the people, right, and, um, you know, clearly, you know, the, again, it's, it's a very theatrical image, okay, you see, you know, the, the, the darkened skies, okay, and, and you see Lenin here, right, being shown in profile, right, okay, I mean, he appears to be larger than life, okay, and, uh, you know, he's standing almost like uh, riding on the, you know, on, 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 on the, the Russian flag, right, okay, and, you know, while addressing the people, okay, lo looking very, you know, determined and, and, and uh, you know, and fiery, okay. So, obviously, you know, it's a kind of, I mean, this was before, you know, the TV was really invented and, you know, again, you know, it's how Lenin wanted, you know, him to be seen by, right, the people, okay. And it's likewise today with, on the TV as well, where politicians again are shown, right, you know, uh, in, a certain, in a certain way. This is a very uh, well-known painting as well, okay. I don't know whether you've heard of the Benjamin West, okay. Now, Benjamin West, uh, well, the Americans claim him to be an American artist because he was born in Pennsylvania, okay, but actually, um, after that, he actually went to Italy, where he was um, exposed to the art of the Renaissance masters and to classical art, okay, and then after which he went to London, okay, and actually in London, he was so taken in by the cosmopolitan atmosphere that he decided to stay permanently, right, but he's still considered to be an American artist. Right, and, um, and in London, I think, I believe he became one of the founders of the Royal Academy of Art. Okay. Um, so this painting itself, okay, is entitled The Death of General Wolfe, James Wolfe. Okay. And um, now this uh, is an actual historical episode. Okay. It depicts the moment when it, it it was uh, what you call the French Indian Wars. Okay, I mean the, the French were allies with the Indians against the British. Okay, James Wolfe was a British uh, general. Okay, and um, West shows him at a moment where he was mortally wounded. Okay, but again, you know, West was trying to inject some theatrical elements to this painting. Okay, now um, it's only known that out of the people there only one could be verified as having been present. Okay, so he's actually a lieutenant. Can you see the person carrying the flag? Okay, and he can, he's the only person that we can verify who is present, right? Okay, during the last moments of James Wolfe. Okay, and he, and the artist also added, can you see the Mohawk Indian on the, on the left? Okay, the kind of noble savage. Okay, and he's in the kind of universal pose of contemplation. Right. I think here Wes wanted to show his uh, English audience that, you know, this painting or this war actually took place, right? He wanted to situate this painting within America itself. Hence, I, I think the inclusion of the American Indian. Okay. Um, now, Wes, uh, you know, he was very much in favor of what he called um, or he was trained in the, in the mold of what he called academic painting, right? Okay, and one of the, the, the favorite genre of academic painting is history painting, okay? Which, now, history painting normally shows um, very noble heroic themes, okay? And I think this also falls into that, that category as well, okay? He wanted to immortalize the death of James Wolfe, okay? And, I want you to draw your attention to the pose of James Wolfe. Okay, have you all seen that pose before in Renaissance paintings? Okay, in scenes of what you call the deposition or the lamentation, when Jesus was brought down from the cross, okay, he's always shown in this position. Can you see? I mean, the artist really wanted to, sh to draw an analogy between the sacrifice of James Wolfe for his country and the sacrifice of Jesus. Right? Very clearly here, he's seen, you know. So this, all in all, is, is, you know, it's a political image, right? Okay. Um, again, you know, again, the theatrical setting, the, the clouds and all that, right? Adds to the kind of, the, the theatrical quality of the painting. Ah, this, I think you have seen it, <laughs> right? Um, it's a poster, 
Okay, and um, it was designed by James Montgomery Flagg. Right? Um, in fact, it was designed for the cover of what you call this magazine called Leslie's Weekly. Okay, and um, you know, an American has made a decision at that time to enter the war. We are talking about World War I. Right? Okay, so the, the whole, I mean, of course, you know, th this is a propaganda poster, okay, that, um, you know, wanted um, Americans to enlist in the war, right? Okay, and it's about American preparedness as well in the war. Okay, and, you know, James Montgomery Flagg, um, you know, used his own face for this poster. He, of course, he added a beard and all that, okay, but actually it's like his self-portrait, right? Okay, and I think, I think President Roosevelt at that time, was it Theodore Roosevelt, right? Found that quite uh, fascinating or interesting that, um, you know, the illustrator actually used his own uh, face, okay, for Uncle Sam, okay? Now again, Uncle Sam, you know Uncle Sam, right? Uncle Sam is like a personification of America, okay? And um, this is Uncle Sam, and there's some theory as to how Uncle Sam, the, the name itself, originated. Some say that he was an actual meat packer, okay, who shipped meat to the American forces, okay, but we are not exactly sure, right? So, you know, such posters are, are very um, um, powerful, okay, and in fact, you know, although this was designed for World War One, okay, um, it was revive again for World War II. So in World War II, it was still used, right, this particular poster. Okay, and you know, it says that posters during World War II were designed to instill in the people a positive outlook, a sense of patriotism and confidence. Okay, that's what propaganda posters can do. Okay, and it can also play to the fears, frustration and faith, okay, in freedoms that linger in people's minds during the war. Now this one is, um, uh, can be found in, the, um, in Mexico, in the National Palace, right, on three adjoining walls. Okay. And it was uh, painted by um, you know, one of Mexico's greatest muralists. Okay. I would say not only Mexico's, but one of the greatest, uh, I would say, muralists you know, in, in, art, in the history of art, okay, Diego Rivera. Okay. And you know, Diego Rivera was quite notorious. Okay, of course, he's most famous as the wife of Frida Kahlo, okay, but also notorious for the way that he treated her. Okay, and he's also notorious for his uh, own uh, communist ideals. Okay, uh, so he's a very um, controversial figure. Okay, but anyway, um, I believe he was uh, commissioned to do this uh, mural. Okay, and at that time when it was painted, this was, sorry, it's in 1929. 1929, um, the Mexican um, government was looking, f you know, uh, you know, for a kind of identity, right? Okay, so there was a kind of a nationalistic spirit that was going on at that time. Okay, you know, I mean, Mexico's history, if you know its history, I mean, um, you know, it's been occupied by foreign people from time to time, right? I mean, firstly, you have the Spanish conquistadors, the Spanish conquest, right? Okay, and then after that, uh, you know, some of the Western powers came as well, right? Okay, and then the Mexicans had to fight for independence, okay? And then they came under the dictatorship of uh, this man called Diaz, D-I-A-Z, okay? And, um, and the, the, the kind of uh, anti-Indian sort of um, uh, attitude, okay, of uh, Diaz, in fact, led to the revolution of uh, 1910, I think, or 1911, okay? So, what Diego Rivera wanted to do in this uh, mural is that he, he was trying to redress or reclaim, right, um, you know, Mexican history again, okay? To, to, you know, to make people take pride, right, in the heritage of Mexico. Right? Because he was an indigenous Mexican himself. Okay, so it's quite a, there's a lot here right, in the mural. Okay, so he, start, he starts by telling the story of this um, uh, Mexican god. 
okay, uh, one of the, the great Aztec, Aztec gods, right? And then he, re he relates the stories, the achievements of the Aztecs and the Mayans. All right, and then he goes through history, he talks about, I mean, he, he paints the, the conquest, the Spanish conquest, the independence, the revolution. Okay? And interestingly, if you look on the right, okay, it, can you see the image on the right, the top right? Do you see a familiar figure there, the bearded figure? <laughs> Who is that? Karl Marx, right? Okay, Karl Marx. Okay? I mean, perhaps he surreptitiously sort of, you know, uh, included Marx there, okay, and it didn't cause a controversy like it caused in America, where you know uh, I think it was in the Rockefeller Center or something, right? Where you know they actually did, you know um, sort of um, I think they destroyed that mural, okay. But this particular one shows Marx there. He's carrying a banner, okay, indicating the kind of ideal society that he wanted to have, okay. And Marx, I believe, on his right, you can see some workers, but below him. Okay, uh, what they call corrupt uh, clergy, okay, greedy capitalists, right, and people like that. And on the bottom right, you'll see the revolutionaries, right, okay, who who who, who helped, you know, in, in the Mexican Revolution, right. Um, I think the one in the sombrero is uh, Pancho Villa. You know, Pancho Villa was a great, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary. Okay, so what Rivera was trying to do with this, of course. A very nationalistic mural, okay, right? He wanted to show the struggles of Mexican people, right, against what he perceived to be, you know, the di dictators, okay, and the imperialist forces, right? Okay, this is a quote by Mao Zedong. Okay, I mean, like all social realists, right? I mean, you have Stalin, Lenin, um, I suppose uh, Hitler, right? Uh, you know, he believed that there's no such thing as art for art's sake. Okay, right? And he believed that art is always geared towards certain definite political lines. Okay, and he insists that art should serve the proletariat revolution. Now these are the, the many thousands of posters that have been created during you know Mao's time. Okay, and people actually collect these posters today. Okay, and um, and many of these posters were in fact um, created by very esteemed and established artists. Okay, in fact there was a kind of uh, if you look at you know the, the caption propaganda team. Okay, there was actually a propaganda team. Okay, that was devoted to creating these posters. Okay. And uh, such images are quite common. You see smiling people or sometimes determined people. Okay. But what do they have in their hands? They always have the little red book. Okay. Okay. Um, the quotations of Mao Zedong. All right. And um, okay, so the, the caption says, Long live Chairman Mao. So it's very clear, right, what um, you know, the intention of this poster is. Let's look at the next one. Now this one shows the man himself, Chairman Mao. Okay. I mean, it's not difficult to kind of um, interpret the poster. Okay, some of it is quite straightforward. I mean, I mean, you have the caption first, and the caption says, Turn China into a prosperous, rich, and powerful, industrialized socialist country under the leadership of Chairman Mao. Okay. So in the background you see cranes and other machinery. Okay. And these are symbols of industry. Right? Okay. And, um, you know, and you see the railway as well with the train. Okay. Right. And um, in front there are fruits and it's quite clear what the fruit symbolizes. Abundance. Okay. Prosperity. Okay. And you see Mao here waving to the people, smiling. Wearing his typical Mao suit, okay, and he's carrying a scroll, okay. I mean, the message is clear. Okay, he wanted to show himself as the chief architect, okay, the chief architect of the country, right? Who lead the country to prosperity, 
and to riches. Okay, and another one. I find them quite interesting, you know, Mao posters. You know, if you have the time, you know, okay, try to look at them. I mean, there are, there are many books, okay, devoted to, to this uh, genre. Um, this is a Mao badge. Okay, today Mao badges are collectibles. Okay, but at that time, during the Cultural Revolution in the, in the 60s and 70s, okay, such badges are actually, um, you know, iconic symbols of loyalty and a sense of belonging. Okay. If you don't wear them, it means there's something wrong. Okay? You, you, you're probably excluded for political reasons. Right? Um, and I think during the Cultural Revolution, uh, five million of these okay, were produced. Right? And um, now the iconography of this badge, this particular badge, is quite complex actually. Right? Uh, First, you'll find um, okay, Mao himself, juxtaposed against a red sun. Of course, red standing for the Communist Party. Okay, again, in the usual post of the orator. Right? Now, can you see the kind of platform below him? Okay, the kind of platform, and with the hammer and sickle. Okay, now, there's a date there that says, I think, 1921 okay, to, I think, 1969, if I'm not mistaken. Can't be nice, it's nice to be okay. But anyway, the first date is 1921. Okay, that's really the founding of the Communist National Congress. Right? So I believe this batch was done to commemorate the ninth National Congress of the Communist Party. Okay. And then you see um, three other images there. You see the mountain. Okay, the mountain was the birthplace of the Red Army. I think it's Chen Kang Shan, is it? Something like that, okay, and then you'll see um, the 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 pagoda in Yan'an. Okay, Yan'an was the venues, right, for many of these communist activities, and then you'll see Tiananmen Square. Okay, Tiananmen of, of course is the political heart, right, of the Communist Party. Okay, and you'll see also plum blossoms. Okay, now interestingly, now plum blossoms is you know is features quite a lot in fact in the propaganda. Of um, you know of the Communist Party, okay during Mao's time, because it actually stands not only for um, spring, okay, it also stands for endurance, okay. Hence you see the plum blossoms there. <laughs> this is quite interesting, okay. Uh, you know, um, these two propaganda. Uh, Prince, okay, were created during the French uh, Vietnam War. Okay, the French Vietnamese War. Okay, and um, they both have the same theme. Okay, telling people to um, not to buy foreign goods. Okay, it's a message about self sustainability, self reliance. Okay, now the first, the one at the top, um, was done in the style of a New Year print. Okay, even using the kind of the same paper. Okay, and it's very interesting. Um, it shows the a girl, okay, the shopkeeper selling cigarettes. Okay, and if you can see clearly, the cigarettes say Philip Morris. All right, and you can see the girl using trying to use a charm and some of her seductiveness, okay, to try to get a man to buy. Okay, right, but the man, you know. Uh, very, they have decided, you can see that they are walking away and they say, Kong Mua, right? I'm not buying. Okay, they are very firm on that. Okay. And the one below is done in a mixed media style. Okay. It's uh, done in a rather flat graphic style, right? It shows um, a, a man with a bicycle or maybe a tricycle, okay, um, with, you know, chock full of um, goods. Foods, textile, and other goods, right? And you can see that um, below, you can see two figures there, okay. And by the flex, you can tell their nationality, right? One's a French, one an American, okay. Again, the message there is clear, right? Buy homemade goods. Do not buy luxurious foreign goods, okay. And you can see that the French and the um, American figures are crushed under the weight of the, the kind of luxury goods that they were trying to sell. Okay. 
So you know, if you if you read Vietnamese uh, history or even Vietnamese art, okay, artists uh, you know were very active in helping to support, right, Ho Chi Minh and his uh, you know revolutionary ideals. Okay, they play a very active role. Okay. Um, this one is uh, an American artist. It's quite interesting, right, Sigmund Abilis. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Vietnam with Helicopter and Kids, number three. Um, it's a protest against the Vietnam War. Okay, and uh, in particular, the, the napalm bombing okay, that took place in the, um, the Vietnam War. Right? And it's quite clear here, you see two children. You know, this reminds me of that famous photograph of that girl running naked. Okay, right, when, uh, you know, what was it? Agent Orange, right? That was the use of the bomb, the, 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 the bomb Agent Orange, right? Um, okay, in any case, um, you see a fleet of helicopters approaching, okay, and two children, okay, running away terrified. Okay, one is actually, the one on the left is actually screaming, okay, and the one on the right, okay, is already, you know, uh, sprawled on the ground, okay, probably unconscious. Okay. So this was a kind of um, anti-war, you know, this is not a war propaganda um, work, but it's an anti-war propaganda. Okay, because um, Sigmund Abilis belonged to this group called Art Against Racism and War, right? Um, and, and clearly this, you know, this uh, work is intended to send a kind of anti-war message. And which leads me to this... Um, most famous work. He some call it one of the greatest, uh, you know, paintings of the 20th century. Okay, uh, Pablo Picasso Guernica. Okay. Now this painting was actually done for the Spanish Pavilion in the Paris um, Exposition in 1937. Okay, and I believe uh, you know Picasso did not yet have a team. Uh, sorry, that should be 1937, not 1037. Okay, but um, at about the same time, what happened was that the Spanish Civil War broke out and then there was a bombing on the Basque town of Guernica okay, by General Franco's troops. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, and General Franco had the help or the aid of the Nazis. Okay, so the Nazis actually helped General Franco to bomb the Basque town of Guernica, resulting in the death of 2,000 civilians. Okay, and you know, Picasso was so incensed by this whole episode, this whole carnage, okay, that he felt that he must do something, okay, that would, you know, expose this cruelty to the world. So he decided to do this large painting. It is a huge painting, right? And um, it's like a mural size painting. Okay, and, and here you can see that. Um, you know, by, by looking at it, for example, is is painted in monochrome, okay, and one can see why it's done that way, okay, because Picasso wanted to, you know, to suggest the the bleakness, right, as well as the the kind of, um, um, you know, the the terror, okay, of the war itself, okay, that's why it's done in monochrome. And if you can look at the jagged, the very jagged, fragmented forms and the distorted faces, okay, all that also convey the terror and the pain of the war, right? So this is done in a very typical Picasso cubist style, okay, the jagged, fragmented forms, the distortion, right? And I just want to highlight just a few, okay, not all of it, okay? I think the interesting one is the, the horse, okay, now the horse, um, we know this because Picasso actually came forward, okay, to try to um, you know tell us, okay, what the various figures signify. Okay, the horse actually stands for the people who, you know, the, the innocent civilians, the people themselves, right? And you can see that it's screaming out, it's crying out in agony, its tongue being replaced by, you know, a kind of a knife-like sort of uh, shaped object, a spike, okay, like a spike, okay. And you see that spike happening as well, okay, um, in that woman, this, uh, where is that, 
yeah, I mean, you know, some of the tongues are being replaced by spikes, okay, similarly to the horse, right? And the bull itself, the bull or the minotaur, okay, um, in fact, it's a common motif in Picasso's work, okay? And in this case, it's thought that the bull represents aggression, okay? That's to say, General Franco's troop, okay? But if you look at the bull, it doesn't look so fierce, right? So aggressive, okay? So maybe Picasso have intentionally left it a bit ambiguous here right and then below the bull we see an a uh, 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 screaming mother okay cradling probably her dead child right and she also has spikes for a tongue okay screaming out in pain and agony um, and for that image she actually made a reference to the pieta the famous sculpture by Michael Angelo okay I mean Picasso for this painting he made references okay to some historical uh, paintings Right. Um, the one on the right, extreme right, you'll see a figure with the arms uh, outstretched and you know, apparently like falling down from a burning building. Okay. But in that sort of pose as well, it resembles Christ. Okay. And it, it seemed that you know, Picasso was making a reference to this famous work by Francisco Goya, the third of May. Okay, we should also have this Christ-like figure as well. Okay, and another interesting one is the man. Can you see the man lying down? He holds a sword, a broken sword. Okay, but on, on the sword itself has sprouted a flower. Okay, so that's interesting. Maybe, you know, again, there's many interpretations about the flower. Okay, maybe Picasso is trying to say that there's still hope, okay, amidst all this violence, okay, and killing. Okay, but it's a clear political statement. It's an anti, it's a, a protest piece, in fact, right, against the Spanish Civil War, right? And later on, this was to travel to America. And I think it wasn't returned until the 1970s when democracy was restored in Spain. That, that was Picasso's condition, okay? That this painting will not return, okay? To Spain until democracy was restored. Now this is interesting. This is, uh, uh, we're coming to Indonesia, okay? Um, now in Indonesia, um, as you know, uh, during the Japanese occupation, um, you know, the Japanese, uh, ironically, uh, I mean, they were the ones who um, supplied the Indonesians with, um, with painting materials, with studios, okay, and then they held exhibitions of their works. Okay, so it was the Japanese rather than the Dutch, the colonial masters, okay, who in fact, uh, you know, um, did a lot, okay, in, 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 the, in the area of art, okay, for the Indonesian people, okay. And after the war, what happened was that, as you know, the Indonesians continued the struggle with the Dutch, right, okay. And uh, in fact, artists joined the revolution quite actively, okay. They joined Sukarno, okay. They went to Yogyakarta, okay. Yogyakarta then became the center of the revolution against the Dutch. And, um, and artists uh, created posters, prints, you know, paintings, okay, um, you know, that, that, um, that are, again, you know, um, anti-Dutch, okay, um, anti-colonial, right? And um, this is one example. Um, I think the title itself is also named Guerrilla Guards, okay, Guerrilla, because what you see here is a guerrilla soldier but it seems to be quite theatrical right this whole painting okay you see um, you know a, a gorilla a lone gorilla um, um, guard here holding his rifle okay looking you know towards you know um, probably standing guard right looking very determined right and um, and you can see that the clouds are darkened. Okay, so it seems like the whole painting is, is staged, right? And in the background, you see two men there having a smoking, a smoke break, right? But I think yet, you know, we cannot hide the fact that, you know, war has taken its toll. Okay, you see desolation, you see ruined buildings, okay? But yet, I think the artist, Sujoyono, wanted to show the determination Okay, the perseverance of 
the Indonesian people, right, in this struggle against the Dutch. Okay? Right? In fact, you know, Sojoyono later on was to, to head this movement okay, that was uh, against um, uh, the other sort of uh, movement that um, painted under the influence of the Dutch. Okay? They painted a very beautiful landscape and all that. Okay, but Sujoyono had a movement that painted reality. Okay, that, paint, that did paintings that was rooted right, in reality. Right? Okay, I think I uh, just have a few more images to go. Um, this is interesting. This is a cigarette lighter, as you know. Okay, and this cigarette lighter is actually the, what you call the ABC sunny lighter. Okay, they were given to um, South Korean troops. Okay, and um, this particular lighter commemorates the sinking of the spy ship, the North Korean spy ship during the Second Korean War. Okay, so you have um, this, this uh, uh, you, you can see on the left, okay, the fighter jets, okay, sinking, right, the, the spy ship, right, and on the right, um, you see the logo, okay, of the militia, or of the unit, rather, that, um, you know, that were responsible for the sinking of the ship. Okay? So, you know, even cigarette lighters can spread propaganda. Okay? Um, in fact, this is quite similar to the, what you call a zippers, if I'm not mistaken. Right? They were given to American troops during the Vietnam War. All right? Now, this uh, is a poster. Okay, and uh, you know, in 1964, of course, uh, Tokyo, right, Japan hosted the Olympic Games. Okay, and I think it was the opportunity for Japan, right, to showcase its post-construction efforts. Okay, and in a sense, to to um, kind of um, show the world, okay, the extent to which it has recovered from, okay, the war itself, right. Um, and this um, poster itself was designed by quite an innovative designer, okay, uh, Kamikura. Okay, it's one of four posters that were done for the Tokyo Olympic. And in fact, the first photograph okay, that was used to promote the Olympics. So this was the first time that photography was used to promote the Olympic Games. Okay. Now, interestingly, if you look at the logo itself, Okay, besides the five Olympic rings on top, quite prominently you have a graphic motif of the rising sun, right? Um, okay, and the person running there is a, a track and field athlete called Tanaka. Okay, um, in fact, the, the final red lake was run by this particular person. I don't know whether he's uh, an athlete or not, right? But the final leg was run by this person who, symbolic, who was chosen for a symbolic reason. He was actually born on August the 6th, 1945, the day that the Americans bombed Hiroshima. <laughs> okay, right. But it's not this particular person, but another, right? Another person. Now this is... Um, North Korean propaganda, <laughs> right? It's a painting, right? And um, it was a painting um, done uh, to perpetuate the myth of the dear leader, Kim Il Sung. Okay? He called himself the dear leader. And um, the mountain you see there is Mount Pektu. Okay? Mount Pektu. Mount Pektu is actually considered to be sacred to the North Koreans, somewhat like Mount Fuji in Japan, right? And uh, in fact, uh, it was said that um, dear leader himself, Kim Il-sung, was born here in Mount Pektu. In fact, it was true because his father, in fact, fought the Japanese from, from the base here, right, in the mountains. Right? So you see here, you know, I mean, this painting, you know, with exploding fireworks, okay, probably celebrating, commemorating the birth of the dear leader, right? Um, you know, amidst again, you know, you, what you see there are lofty peaks, forests, lakes, okay? Now all this can be seen as, again, uh, metaphors or metaphors for the characteristics 
of the Korean race, right? Okay, so, and again, as I mentioned, you know, um, Mount Pektu was um, also considered to be um, the birthplace of the divine um, founder of the Korean um, people, okay? A man called, I believe, uh, hmm. okay, I, anyway, I can't remember, right? It's something like Jimu, you know, the, the, the divine founder of the Japanese, okay? Uh, of Japan, right, Jimu, right? So it was thought that um, Kim Il-sung himself kind of borrowed and appropriated okay, from the myth of Japan, okay, for his own political purposes, right, in this painting. Okay, two more works to go. Now this is uh, one of the most famous or most iconic, okay, um, you know, image, okay, and you know, it persists even to today. Okay, people still find this so fascinating. Right. Okay. And um, of course, the original photo was taken by um, this man called Alberto Corda. Okay, who of course worked is a photographer for the Cuban government under Castro. Okay. And um, here, you know, this this uh, the title of this work is entitled "Heroic Guerrilla." Okay, it's an image of Che Guevara. Right, Che Guevara. And this, the original photo was in fact taken by Corda during a memorial service, okay, for some bomb victims, okay, and in fact it's part of a larger photo, in fact uh, Corda actually cropped it, edited it, in fact there was another silhouette on the, le on the left, another person, and in the background there's a kind of a palm tree, okay, but he cropped all that, okay, and I think by cropping that, right, he has made the image timeless, right. Okay, and he has really immortalized okay, Che Guevara in history. Okay, and, but I think that aside, if you look at the, the, the picture of Che Guevara, I mean, you look, what struck Corder the most was his facial expression, right? The resolute expression of his face, the searching eyes. Okay, that attracted, you know, um, you know Corder to Che Guevara. Of course, Guevara was the one who, you know, who supported the Castro government, right? And then he later, you know, went to fight the Bolivians, you know, he was to be, I think he was executed, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, okay, so he has come to stand for certain ideals, the, what he called the revolutionary ideal, okay? So, Corder believed that this image of um, Che Guevara embodied that revolutionary ideal. That's why he didn't copyright, he didn't make this, you know, he didn't um, want to take any royalties from this image. Because he says that the, the, the more widely circulated this image is, the more widely the ideals of Che Guevara will spread. Okay, I mean his only objection was that it should not be used for commercial purposes. Right, okay. Um, and so this image has come to, to stand for, you know, Marxist ideals. It has come to stand for youthful idealism. Okay, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you'll see that probably people in the 1960s, you know, the psychedelic 60s, would, you know, how they would um, see this image as something that represents their own ideals. And even today, right, it stands for independence, defiance, okay, revolution, okay. So it's really a timeless image. And it's even made more popular by Jim Fitzpatrick. Okay, Jim Fitzpatrick, in fact, by, you know, making a kind of a pop art image of him, in fact, helped to spread, okay, uh, the popularity of this image even more, right? Okay, so this is a stylized version, almost exact, you know, almost the exact of the original version, as you can see, right? And also, you know, um, he also admired uh, Che Guevara, as he says. Okay, and he wants to commemorate him okay, uh, with this um, version of his. And lastly, quite similar to Jim Fitzpatrick's uh, you know, uh, poster of Che Guevara, uh, is um, a poster of Barack Obama. Okay, done quite recently, in about 2008, during the election campaign. Right, um, in fact, for, you know, 
I mean, the, um, it didn't start start out as a kind of uh, you know government initiative or something or an Obama mm -hmm. initiative. In fact, uh, Ferry probably did it out of his admiration. Okay, as he says about the, the, the power and the sincerity of uh, Obama as a speaker. Okay, and you know he did um, you know a poster of this, right? In fact, the original poster has the word progress. Okay, and in fact the the U.S. government wanted to dis distance itself from this because uh, it thought that this was perpetuated rather illegally, so he wanted to have nothing to do with it. But in fact, Ferry, was, Ferry said that you know, some of the campaign people of Obama came to him after he produced this poster and told him to change the name from Progress to Hope. All right. Okay, so that's, that's what he did. And, um, and this was reproduced okay, or, or printed okay, hundreds of, and thousands of times. Okay? Posters, stickers, I think even on t-shirts, right? And yes, the, the colors of the American flag, right? Um, I mean, it bears striking similarity to Che Guevara's image, I think, okay? Again, you know, both are shown not exactly front, in the frontal view, okay? I mean, their, their heads are sli slightly tilted, okay? Um, and they both, like, look up. Right, giving a sense of uh, lending a sense of timelessness to the figure. Right now, if you look on the right, that's the original AP photo. Okay, and unlike the Che Guevara photo, there was copyright problems this time. Okay, because AP in fact wanted to so-called sue Ferry for some compensation for using the image. Okay. But Ferry claimed that he had fair use of the photograph. Okay. But no one really quite know the outcome of the trial. It was settled out of court. Right? Okay. But nonetheless, you know, in the age of new media, right? in fact, this whole image went viral. Right? Okay. And one is not far-fetched to say that Shepard Ferry's poster of Obama helped him to win the election. Right? In fact, the president himself sent the artist a thank you letter, right? <laughs> I think after his election victory. Okay, uh, that's it for this session. I hope you enjoyed it.